Hi folks, Joseph Kursky here with you to discuss what is spatial thinking? What is spatial thinking? Spatial thinking has been receiving increased atten attention in the past several years. One reason could be the rapid expansion of geotechnologies from the GIS community to the general public including recreational GPS, in-car navigation devices, and virtual globe software. Another reason could be recognition that accelerating globalization means that we can no longer be complacent about increasing the amount of spatial thinking in the educational curriculum at all levels. In other words, we can't say, well, that'd be a good thing. No, it's critical. We're also starting to realize that global issues such as biodiversity loss, urban sprawl, energy needs, water quality and availability, natural hazards and human health are becoming increasingly complex and beginning to affect our everyday lives. Moreover, they all have a spatial component. To grapple with, to deal with these issues for the 21st century requires a populace that's adept at using GIS and other geotechnologies. Also piquing people's interest in spatial thinking may be the National Research Council's 2005 report, Learning to Think Spatially. GIS as a support system in the K-12 curriculum, which recommends that spatial thinking be recognized as a fundamental part of K-12 education due to its importance as a problem-solving tool in many different disciplines. Rather than as a separate course, it states that the U.S. needs a national initiative to integrate spatial thinking across the curriculum in courses such as mathematics, history, science, etc and that the country needs standards to be developed that can be used in teacher training and student assessment. This may be encouraging people to consider graphicacy equally important as teaching numeracy and literacy. Graphicacy. There may be other equally valid reasons for the increased attention to spatial thinking and learning. Through Jerome Dobson's articles in ARC News and elsewhere, Dr. DeBlay's book, Why Geography Matters, and even through works by others outside the geography community, such as Friedman's The World is Flat, the message is clear. We ignore the world at our peril. Those who have taught with GIS for the past few decades have long advocated spatial thinking as the foundation for success in problem solving with GIS. In fact, geographers and geography teachers have promoted spatial thinking for centuries. Many welcome this new attention to spatial thinking and are hopeful for the future. Without spatial thinking, the complex issues facing our world cannot be effectively and completely dealt with. Without spatial thinking, scale may be critical to a problem but ignored. Without spatial thinking, a person can be proficient in working with GIS software tools but will likely have difficulty in thinking outside the software box, considering problems holistically and examining problems from a spatial perspective, whether they use GIS or other tools. Space, representation, and reasoning. Let's discuss that. There are many ways to conceptualize spatial thinking. The National Research Council stated that to think spatially entails knowing about, number one, space, different ways of calculating distance, coordinate systems, and the nature of spaces in two and three dimensions. Space can be thought of as absolute locations such as latitude, longitude, universal transverse mercator, or the British national grid. Space also includes relative location. Uh, the library is next to the store and down the hill from my house. Adjacency, intersections and regions. Number two, representation. The relationship among views, orthogonal versus perspective maps, the effect of map projections, and how features can be displayed cartographically as images, points, lines, and polygons. Number three, reasoning. Different ways of thinking about distances, the great circle route versus straight line mapped routes, for example. The ability to extrapolate and interpolate, projecting a relationship on a graph into the future, estimating the slope of a hillside from a contour map, selecting a detour, and so on. I define spatial thinking as the recognition, consideration, and appreciation of the interconnected processes and characteristics among the atmosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, geosphere, and anthrosphere, human impact, and biosphere, living things, at a scale and time period appropriate to the phenomena under study. Let's talk about concepts and skills for a moment. 
as the learning to think spatially report recommended, we must encourage an informed spatial thinking. In other words, rather than a vague notion that where things are is important, students must understand spatial concepts such as the intersections and the interconnectedness of elevation with ecoregion zonation, relative and absolute distance, map projections, and Earth-Sun relationships. They must also understand spatial representations beyond maps to diagrams, globes, satellite imagery. They must be able to use spatial skills in problem-solving contexts. Geographer Reg Gollidge, one of my favorite people of all time, identifies important spatial skills and understandings in many of his writings. For example, one must be able to translate from one dimension to another, as in creating a two-dimensional map from a 3D Earth. One must understand the differences between distance properties such as adjacency, proximity, similarity, nearest neighbor, crow fly distance, and over the road distance. One must comprehend orientation and direction, including compass bearings, angular bearings, and clock face. The tower is at 2 o'clock from our trails heading directions. A spatially skilled person understands frames of reference, latitude, longitude, UTM, street numbering systems, and national grids. That person recognizes geographic associations, such as the connection between downhill snow skiing and mountains and the relative lack of cities and desert areas versus a denser pattern in agricultural areas. The spatially skilled person must understand regions, everything from census tracts, police precincts, school districts, to ecoregions, production areas, uh, counties, and biomes. Gollidge points out that if you understand the spatial concepts that are part of nearly every facet of everyday life, from using spatial principles when packing the trunk of your car for a family vacation to walking safely out to the kitchen sink in the middle of the night without turning on the lights, you are thinking spatially. Indeed, you can help students transfer everyday spatial thinking into an informed spatial thinking so that they can deal with and grapple with the important issues of our time from biodiversity to energy to epidemics. There are hundreds of excellent ways to teach spatial thinking, from gathering field data with your students to creating models of Earth-Sun relationships. One of the best ways to foster spatial thinking and analysis is to, in my opinion, use a tool that was created especially for spatial analysis, and that is a geographic information system. GIS can be used to understand patterns, relationships, linkages, movement, regions, location, and place from human systems to physical systems to human environment interaction. GIS can be used for studying issues as the, at the local scale to the national, regional, or global scale. Fundamental to problem solving, let's talk about that. GIS is composed of software, could be online, could be software as a service nowadays. Increasingly software as a service is no longer just resonant to your desktop computer. Hardware, spatial data, procedures or methods, and most important of all, people. It is the person who turns spatial data into knowledge and communicates that knowledge to others so that more informed decisions can be made. The GIS education community is concerned about spatial thinking because it is the spatially literate person who can make the most of GIS analyses. One can build fine models with accurate spatial data, but without spatial thinking, folks, the results won't be fully seen for what they are, and the information will not be transferred as effectively. Therefore, along with nurturing GIS skills, we must encourage spatial thinking as fundamental to all GIS analysis. We must teach some basic, basic concepts, sure, if we hope to have students grapple with advanced spatial problems. For example, I recently had university students locate a fire tower using a digital elevation model, land cover, hydrology, and roads. Many of the students didn't grasp the problem because they didn't understand what a DEM was or even how elevation was represented. We therefore spent some time, okay, let's step back, working with topographic maps and isolines. What's an isoline? It wasn't the students' fault. They were simply products of a K-12 education system where they were lucky to have a geography class way back in you know, grade seven. Take advantage of these moments to teach spatial concepts and skills, even in advanced courses. We should also encourage students to think holistically and spatially about problems with which they are wrestling while using GIS software and skills. Sometimes students review available tools then frame the problem accordingly. This could result in a narrow view of the problem. Encourage them to think about the whole problem first and then model how they will use GIS to help them address it. 
encouraged them also to think beyond the software. Spatial analysis preceded GIS. Spatial analysis preceded GIS. It goes way back to the 19th century. And some analytical methods are better combined with other tools. Use GIS as what, what could be one of several analytical tools to make effective decisions. Let's chat for a moment about the whys of where, shall we? The most important question that a spatial thinker asks is not where, but why? Why? Where by itself is important, but to stop there cuts short spatial thinking and subsequent spatial analysis. At its best, where by itself is a scaffold upon which we can hang other geographic knowledge and build skills. At its worst, where by itself is the place name, capes and bays memorization that made, makes all geographers twitchy. It kind of like, it's like the nails on a chalkboard, you know, it's like <sighs> To nurture spatial thinking, we must couple the where with why. One way to illustrate these thoughts about spatial thinking is to examine uh, this photograph and ask, what's wrong with this picture? The spatial thinker looks at the world in spatial terms, requiring, inquiring about the whys of where. I was once invited to speak at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Upon my arrival, the above scene here struck me as odd, prompting me to take this photograph. Why would stadium bleachers be overlooking a parking lot? The spatial thinker also thinks temporarily, realizing that spatial objects change over time. One logical conclusion was that the parking lot had been built upon a former athletic field. When was this done? What will it look like in the future? The situation suggests that it won't be long until the bleachers are torn down. Why was the athletic field covered over and paved in the first place? Was the campus expanding, necessitating additional parking? Was campus expansion related to national trends? Or was it a particular NCSU program suddenly in higher demand? If the field was not protected as a historical site, why not? Was a new stadium built elsewhere, elsewhere, etc. I took this photograph of the village of Elham, located in the North Downs in southeast England. The village was first mentioned as Ulaham in an Anglo-Saxon charter of 855 AD. Why was Elham settled in the center of the Elham va Valley instead of on one of the surrounding hillsides? Well, Elham was settled near the river for the same reason most towns are, for access to, to water, for diversion for the fields, for growing crops and watering livestock, and later for river transportation. Yet, we must not stop at considering why. We must also consider how. How was the decision made whereby a parking lot was deemed more important than, than the athletic field? What is the best way to test these hypotheses? Incorporate another how through methods, gather field data through the use of historical and current campus maps, and by conducting interviews on campus. These considerations represent one more way of conceptualizing spatial thinking. Let's chat about habits of mind. Spatially literate people should have an understanding of spatial concepts and have spatial skills attached to their, their tool belts. However, there is more to a spatially literate person. According to the NRC's report, Learning to Think Spatially, Spatially literate people should also have this habit of mind, of, of thinking spatially, which means knowing where, when, how, and why to think spatially. Now, most people I know in the spatial learning and geotechnology education communities fit this characteristic to a T. They seem to know why to think spatially because they seek opportunities to advocate the importance of thinking spatially beyond education into greater society. They seem to know how to think spatially do so from many viewpoints and do th so throughout the day. When reading a map of airline routes in an in-flight magazine, they may consider network analysis, regional transportation, tourism's impact on the environment, etc. When the buds burst forth on trees, they may ponder the effect of latitude, altitude, and climate on the speed of the arrival of spring. When looking at a menu, they may speculate about diffusion and how restaurant fa franchises decide in which cities to locate. When going hiking, they may mark waypoints with their GPS, take photographs, and make sketches thinking about how the landscape has changed in the past and how it will change in the future. How did the spatial and geotechnology education community develop these habits of mind? Well, many claim that since childhood they've always loved maps, geography, or both. Childhood vacations and exploring a vacant lot over the fence may have served to bolster this affinity. However, in most cases, a primary or secondary school class or university program of study has nurtured this love into a lifelong way of thinking and acting. Therefore, 
educators have the important job, the critical job, I say, of inspiring students. The decision makers of tomorrow is what they are, to think spatially, and not just in their GIS or geography classes, but throughout their days and throughout their lives. Yes, educators have the opportunity to shape these habits of mind. Now, folks, I welcome your thoughts about what spatial thinking is and how it can be effectively incorporated into education. Thanks for being with me.